Brilliant. Alexis, pleasure. Alex. Alex. It's just Alex. Oh. Oh. Alexis. <laughs> this is the thing. It's spelled I spelled weird. I... <laughs> What's the S on there for? It's extraneous. It's just to confuse people and make it more difficult it, than it needs to be. <laughs> it, it, my my girlfriend is going <laughs> to... I can't believe I've done that. My, I, I intended to ask you how it's pronounced as well. My girlfriend is going to laugh her head off because I, <laughs> I was I was born in uh, I was born in Wales, yeah. um, and although my parents aren't Welsh speakers, they're, they're Scottish and Irish themselves. I was I I learned Welsh when I was in school, and now I live in England. And I had I had this thing with when I would read a word in English, I would always struggle to pronounce it, and it ended up when I, I'd never heard anyone say the name, and I'd have yeah. this weird pronunciation of it. I get things wrong all the time, so she is going to find that amusing. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> nah, don't worry about it. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, mate, I t- this is hard and fast. I, I mean, when did we when did we engage yeah. each other? A few days ago. Yeah, yeah, a few days ago, and you were like, "Yeah, let's do it." I'm like, "Yeah, let's do it." So, I mean, it's a big thanks to Billiana uh, yeah, for the intro. Yeah. When she pointed me your way, I thought. And I finally got around to listening to the podcast he did on your website. I was like, yeah. flipping heck. This is, we gotta get, got to get this guy on. So for people who don't, I'm going to just give a brief, in fact, it'll be super brief. My understanding is, and what I really like to talk to you about today is what was, I think was, I think was your last role on operations serving alongside the US military. And that, and part of that role, if not all of that role, was as a specialist advisor um, with the, job of engaging and understanding and speaking with the local religious leaders right. and influential people in Iraq, Afghan and those theatres right. with the aim of understanding and then be able to teach back to the US military the best way of going about their campaign because you didn't think right. it was the right way to do things. Right, yeah, that's like, right. I My years are pinned back now. <laughs> Tell, yeah. Speak to me. Yeah, so, you know, first off, let me just say, you know, my name's Alex Thompson. I live uh, in Kansas City, smack dab in the middle of the United States uh, in Missouri. Um, I've been here about five years, but like you said, before that, um, I was a specialist in Islam, Islamic history, the religion, and Arabic. So I, I got out of the Navy in 2000. So I was in the U.S. Navy for four years, and then um, 9-11 happened. So it happened like just around a year after I got out of the Navy. And I was like, you know, what do I do? Do I go back into the military? How can I help? And I was already in graduate school. Um, so I decided to switch my major and I switched to study um, Islam. And I spent um, a bunch of years doing that, working on my PhD. And not only, you know, One of the things that I did was I decided to go live with fundamentalist Muslims in the Middle East. So I studied Arabic for a short period of time and I said, I'm not learning as fast as I need to. I'm not having the difference and the change that I want to have. So I moved to Alexandria, Cairo or Alexandria, Egypt. And I lived with a bunch of um, Muslim converts, people from the US and Europe who had gone to this place because they wanted to espouse fundamentalist, not necessarily violent Islam, but something close to that. And I was like, I want to be with those people. I want to see how they think. I want to, you know, eat with them and live with them. I did that in Egypt. I did that in Yemen. I did that in Oman and Syria and Jordan. And I did that for a period of time. And then not surprisingly, the U.S. military said, hey, we'd like you to come work with us. And so I went to Iraq and, you know, based on my studies, you know, I had been memorizing the Quran and, um, you know, religious law, things like fiqh and aqeda, the, the theology for Islam, you know, so I was just deep into it. And it gave me an opportunity to be able to work with Marine Corps, special forces, U.S. special forces, um, and advise them on how religion impacted their environments. So that's what I did um, from 2008 to 2014. Amazing. One of the things that I, I was trying to understand when I listened to the pod, what's the website? What's the website where the podcast is? This Hero this, Life. This Hero, this Hero Life, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, was, I was trying to understand two things. and uh, Not understand. I was interested in speaking to you about two, two, two things of a, of, a, of a load of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think just in, the, in terms of how you got to where you are now, and, and that is when you were in the – when you were in the Navy, 
what what brought you to the the to decide on the study of Islam? What what led to that decision? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, I was in the Navy. I was I was young and sort of didn't know what I was doing with my life. I did my, you know, we have like a minimum four-year stint. I did that and I got out. Um, and like I said, I was in graduate school. I was already in graduate school studying religion. I was studying Buddhism, right? Like, you know, I got out of the military. I was like in a hippie phase. I had an afro. You know, I walked around in sandals. I was in graduate school in Colorado, so I'd wear sandals in the, in the winter, like in the snow and shit like that. <laughs> You know, um, and so 9-11 happened and it absolutely 100 percent without any question fundamentally changed the course of my life. I became a different person. I became obsessed with the Middle East and obsessed with Islam. And I remember I remember when you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody remembers, but I remember when 9-11 happened, I was asleep. Um, it was the, you know, it was in September. So it was just after graduate school started and I was asleep and you know, I had a basement apartment uh, not even an apartment, just a room in a house. I didn't know anybody in there. You know, it's like a poor graduate student. And I wake up to somebody banging on my door and I'm like, who the fuck is banging on my door this early in the morning? You know, and, and this roommate, this person that I don't know, op- I open the door and he's standing there. He's like, did you see what they did? And I was like, Hey, who, what are you talking about, man? Get out of my room, you know? And he doesn't even respond to me. He just turns around and runs upstairs to the TV. And I'm like, oh, shit, what the fuck's going on here, right? So I get up there just in time to see the first tower um, come crashing down. And, you know, all sorts of emotions, I think, that we all felt. But the, the one question that just kept ringing in my head is, who are they? Who are the people who would do something like this? And that question motivated me for the next 13 years to figure out who they are and why they would do such a horrible thing. Um, And so that's really what motivated me to make such a a sudden, you know, quick change. Um, Over those, I mean, uh, the the balls to go in uh, and go and attempt to be get close to people the fund the extremist fundamentalist you know in, in egypt and in uh on the arabian peninsula you went to saudi as well didn't you no i wasn't in saudi i was in yemen yeah oh yemen sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. It, okay yeah yeah much safer place <laughs> well, than saudi no i'm, I'm joking oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i didn't realize americans had sarcasm <laughs> I usually don't get sarcasm, but in this case, it seemed to work. <laughs> you, you, where did the so uh, going going on to the 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 uh, the the observation that you had? I'm assuming that would develop over a significant period of time, where the campaign. Uh, the war on terror and inverted, you know, in, in quotation marks. Yeah. You came to a, a thought that it was the U.S. military, if not all of the militaries of the world that were involved, yeah. were going about it the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, it, so there's a lot of moments, right? But probably the most important moment was when I first landed in Iraq, and I was assigned to a regiment of Marines in Fallujah. So this would have been in 2008. So um, the army, the U.S. Army had moved out of Fallujah and the U.S. Marine Corps had moved in. And when I landed at the regimental headquarters, I started meeting. So at this point, I was like, you know, two thirds of the way through my Ph.D. program. By then, you know, I was deep into, like I talked about, memorization of the Quran and just a deep understanding of the religion. And, you know part of the U S military standing orders was you're not allowed to interact with religious leaders and you're not allowed to go to the mosque. And so, you know, I'd I'd spent the past, you know, six, seven years, all all of my time was with religious leaders and studying the religion. And I was sort of like scratching my head thinking like, how does this make any sense? You know, why, um, if we are in an environment and a culture where religion is central to everyday life, you know, one of the key things about Islam is that there is no separation between religion and politics, right? In the ideal, in the idealized version of a Muslim reality, there is no separation between church and state, right? It doesn't even make sense. So it's like, this can't 
we this is this does not sound right to me. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, U.S. policy in I said in a lot of ways. In some ways, U.S. policy recognized that you know people like General Petraeus and General McChrystal really championed this coin counterinsurgency. Um, doctrine, right? Which says almost explicitly, we cannot win this war by killing enough terrorists. Right? You cannot kill enough bad guys to win this war. You have to establish um, stability. You have to establish like, normal patterns of life. And so in a lot of ways, I was frustrated and disappointed with how we were carrying out that policy. And I felt like I had a, a unique opportunity, you know, someone who's like stupid, crazy, patriotic, right? Really committed to the U.S., but also deeply entrenched in fundamentalist Muslim thinking. So it gave me an opportunity to first identify what I would say is a, <clears throat> a misunderstanding of the problem and then to do something about it. And I was really lucky. I can't overstate how lucky I was to be in the right place to make the difference that I believed I could make. It, 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 I find it really interesting. I, 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 so I, I did five different tours in the Middle East. Um, and I also, when I left the military, I went on the circuit, the security circuit yeah, yeah. for four years. Okay. Um, and so I sort of, you know, I, I, for an, a, a, a layman, a Neanderthal, not a Neanderthal, a layman, a, a, a novice, I understand, you know, Oh, no, I've had a bit. Not Islam. I've had a bit more exposure to Islam culture than yeah. than most, but much less than than Salam. He's flipping it. Sure, sure. Yourself and anyone else who did any more tours than I did <laughs> experience. One of the roles I had um, in, one, in my last tour, which was in Afghanistan, was in an intelligence capacity, and I distinctly remember um, distinct I distinctly remember. A, a feeling towards we we were taking a bigger focus on hearts and minds, and we always have yeah. hearts and minds. Um, in in the we always have had that in our minds, sure. British anyway. Since 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 ever I, I was in the military and I joined it in two thousand, and and because it plays into part of what you're talking about, the Islamist side of things. You you got to get the people on side. Now, since we've been talking in the last ten minutes, and especially the last few minutes, you talk about betrayers and crystal and that coin uh, doctrine. I can I also can't understand why we wouldn't see why and even I didn't see at the time that religion as another route into engaging the people that's mental yeah I, 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 I I'm trying yeah. to understand it how it could be how we could even just as conscious people there not yeah. realize it I you know so you know just for your awareness you know like I did a PhD in, in this sort of thing. So I tend to talk in like a lot of detail. So just cut me off and say, okay, that's enough of that, right? Go for but, it. Go for it. <laughs> um, I think that there's two primary reasons for it. Um, and one is that in, in U.S. culture anyway, you know, we have this expression about you don't talk about politics and religion at the dinner table, right? There's something about polite society where we – um, think of religion as off limits. That's that's one part of it. It's just off limits for a number of reasons, which you know we don't have to necessarily get into all those reasons. The effect of that is that even really smart, accomplished people have never developed the skills to talk objectively about religion, and so you know. As we are socialized, human beings in general are socialized, we learn by practice, we're habituated into talking about certain things. You know, like we know, like, you know, you know, there's this sort of trend or theme, like when guys are together, you talk about sports, you talk about girls, you talk about, you know, like you sort of know uh, how to act and what to talk about, especially when it's people you don't know, those safe conversations and behaviors and ways of acting. Those are things that we learn. And so anything that's outside of that, becomes difficult. And I, th I think one of the reasons why religion was such a big miss um, in the global war on terror is that it's just something that's been sort of sidelined in, like I said, certainly in American culture. And so that's the first part. The second part is a weird combination of the second thing, which is that we also have very clear concepts of what religion is. And 
probably for most people, peace, happiness, love, compassion, those sorts of things are central to what, quote unquote, we think about, quote unquote, religion. And so even though we don't necessarily talk about religion very much, it's not part of, you know, conversations that we have on a daily basis and certainly not with people that we don't know and trust. We, in the back of our minds, there's this idea that like religion is peaceful and happy and you know, you're, you're going to meditate and feel good about yourself. And terrorism is so fucking violent, right? And it creates such a clear enemy that it's this um, dichotomy, like this irreconcilable problem. Okay, we have religion, Islam, and then we have people blowing themselves up. It's like we can't put those together. So I think those two things are the reason why religion was such a big miss or has been such a big miss because we don't know how to talk about it. And even if we did, even when we do talk about it, we talk about it in such um, pleasant terms that what we were experiencing didn't fit. I think people just didn't know how to talk about it. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> I see what you're saying. What, why is why is um, why is Islam? What, in fact, now why haven't other religions? Or well, it doesn't seem to me that they have. Why haven't other religions evolved in the way that Islam has in terms of its close association with, wrongly or rightly, to terrorism, to violence, to war? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> there are periods of time when other religions have espoused violence in a way that we've seen with Islam and sort of the modern era. Um, why, you know, we have people like um, bin Laden who's able to motivate, energize millions of people, at least hundreds of thousands of people, not necessarily to commit acts of terrorism, but to um, not stand up against it. That's a question I probably don't have an answer to. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's yeah. interesting. Do you know what? It could be maybe or one of the factors is that Islam um, is, is predominantly and I'm, my history, history, knowledge of history is crap, so correct me if I'm wrong. But Islam is predom is pr is prominent in in areas where, um, in parts of the world where it is not easy living, I, uh, uh, and the difficult cultures to to exist in. I mean, the Middle East, Arabian Peninsula, it's hard going, um, and also and because and those those have also been tum tumultuous areas of the world with interest from a lot of other people, which is. Which may it may just be coincidence that the birth of terrorism <laughs> yeah. is also in the place where Islam is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing the thing for me is like I try to like understand, you know, like understand what the people who espouse this um, way of thinking say, you know, and and if you read the more sort of thoughtful, however misguided talking about this, you know, it, it really goes back to things like colonialism, you know, and so there have been centuries of, let's, uh, you know, there have been centuries of something like colonialism in the Middle East, you know, the way that the, the area is partitioned out into countries, the, the mismatch of languages and cultures, etc., has created and so I don't want to necessarily talk about what is. I just want to talk about how it has been interpreted, right? And the way that it's been interpreted as a co-optation or a destruction of a culture, right? Like if you if you read terrorists and what they're saying, you know, these folks who are trying to encourage other people to be violent, it's really about establishing not even a new world order, but the proper order of things that used to exist in some fictional past, right? And so <clears throat> I personally, you know, don't tend to think of it as, um, a, you know, so we think about terrorism, religion is one part of it, but it is not the all of it. You know, it's not the only way that people become convinced to commit such terrible acts. Uh, so you 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 see when we talk about religion, we talk about Islam. Obviously, yeah. Islam isn't all of religion. Religion, uh, yeah, yeah, terrorism. Right. Sorry, and terrorism isn't all of Islam. Um, you talk you 
are you saying there then that Islam is a, a very convenient tool that is that is being used by by terrorists as Islamic fundamentalists to 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 mo- give the call to momentum? Yeah, so you know. <clears throat> I'm going to be a sort of a typical academic here and try not to get pinned down on any one answer because I think it's, it's, you know, there's a lot going on. So what I'm going to do is tell a story. Um, and like it, the way that I came up with my ideas, part of it was um, breeding, but part of it was living uh, in the Middle East. And so, um, like I said, I, I backpacked through Yemen in 2006 2006, 2007, I hopped on a bus. I was living in Oman. I was studying at the National Seminary there. So I was wearing all the traditional Islamic garb and studying with fundamentalists of a different stripe. And one day I was like, oh, I'm going to hop on a bus and I'm going to go to Yemen. Right? I was like, I don't know anybody there. I have no idea what I'm going to do there, but I want to go to Yemen. You know? And there are a lot of really powerful experiences, but one of them um, was I got stuck in the city called Seun. It's in the north of Yemen. And I met, I happened to befriend the son of the local police chief. He was, the son was a, a taxi driver. And he picked me up one day. He was taking me out to see some of the sites and we just became friends and we talked and we spent days and days together. He drove me all around the area, showed me all the ruins and there's, there's no tourists there, right? There are no tourists in Yemen, but um, he showed me all around. And then as I was trying to leave that town, Seun, I found out that I didn't have the right stamp in my passport and I was going to have all sorts of trouble. And that's when I found out that he was the son of the police chief took me to his dad, you know, I get all the stamps I need, you know, I think a lot of us who put ourselves in these situations are lucky to find helpers, right? Like fixers who get in there and like, you're like, oh shit, I don't know how the fuck I'm getting out of this situation, right? And so what the police chief does is he puts me on a bus, which is typically reserved for locals, right? So I speak Arabic, I wear the traditional garb, I can have all sorts of conversations. He puts me on one of those buses. So what I don't know is that he radios ahead and tells all the checkpoints on the way from Seoul to Sena'a, the capital of Yemen, that there's an American on the bus, on this local <laughs> bus, right? So we're, we're chugging along. I didn't know that, right? So we're chugging along. <laughs> we get to the, this is the middle of the night, obviously. We're chugging along. We get to the first checkpoint, middle of fucking nowhere Yemen. I've got no idea where I'm at. And, you know, if, if you've been in these situations, you know there's only one thing that matters, and that's, for us, my blue passport that has that eagle on it that says I'm an American and you can get a lot of money. Don't kill me, right? If you kidnap me, don't kill me, right? And so that's the only thing I have that, you know, nobody knows where I'm at. Nobody can find me. And so we get to the first checkpoint, middle of the night. This young kid gets on there. He's like, oh, where's the American at? You're speaking in Arabic. Wait a minute, right? And so I, I sit there and I'm like, oh, fuck. And I don't say anything. I just sit there, and in my head, I'm having this ridiculous conversation, which is like, "Is he talking about me? Is it is me, me the American?" And 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 everybody laughs at him, right? All the Yemenis they laugh at him. And he trots off, and then another older, sort of more senior, it's like, "Where's the you know, where's the American at?" And and I finally like hold up my passport, and I walk up, and he he grabs my passport, and so I feel naked, like I have no recourse in the world. And I'm standing there at the front of the bus, and I can just feel people, because nobody would have known that I was an American, right? I, I blend in. And so the police officer comes back, hands me my passport, and she's like pissed off at me, sends me back to my seat. <clears throat> this sets the everyone on the bus off. They are pissed that there's an American. They assume I'm from the CIA, right? And like... Within 15 minutes, I'm like, these motherfuckers are going to kill me. Like, I have, there's, not, there's no two ways about it, right? So we ride along. They're just harassing me, giving me a hard time. Out of nowhere, one of the guys gets up, and he sits down next to me, and he's like, hey, what's your name? And he's talking too loud, right? And he's sitting next to me, and he's got his, you know, they carry a knife on their side. You know what I mean? And like, I'm like, he's going to fucking kill me. But he's... What he's doing is he's trying to diffuse the situation by humanizing me, 
right? And he starts asking me, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? What do you study? You know, why are you here? Right. And gives me a chance to engage him as a human being. This is a long story to answer your question, but <laughs> it's a good story. Keep going. <laughs> But what happens is that the folks on the bus begin to, like I said, interact with me as a human being and not as a boogeyman for the United States, right? They start telling me about why they're on the bus, the fact that there are no jobs in Yemen, so they have to go to Kuwait or Qatar. They have to be away from their families. They can't get their uh, diabetes medication. Uh, they they hope that their sons will be able to afford to buy a house and and get and you know, and we spend the next like ten hours getting to know each other like people on buses, trains, and boats all over the world, as if you're going to see each other. And you know, sit down next to somebody on an airplane and and you talk. And we did that. And what I, the thing that I took away from that. One of the most important things, you know, they talked about how they feel helpless against terrorists. That, the, you know, they described how their country is a breeding ground for terrorists all over the world. And they feel like there's nothing they can do about it. And so you asked me, you know, and a question that comes up, you know, is what's the role of religion and terrorism? And it's a question that I tend to try to avoid unless I can be very precise but that moment on the bus in Yemen helped me <clears throat> recognize that there are people steeped in their religion, Muslims, who feel embarrassed and helpless against this movement of assholes, right, who are using concepts, ideas, names, the word Islam to terrorize uh, the world. You know, and so rather than for me trying to come up with an answer like what, you know, what role Islam, like the religion plays in um, terrorism is to carry those stories, right? Like I have the stories of those people in my head and to represent them and to, you know, represent them when I'm able to advise um, military officials or academics or politicians, you know, is to carry that and it doesn't necessarily provide an answer, but it, it gives me a way to sort of engage the conversation, um, if that makes sense. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you back now. Uh, even though I put my phone on, do not disturb by the phone call coming through. <laughs> yep. Um, no, I wouldn't want to be you on that bus at all. I've been around angry mobs of, of yeah. people I've, yeah. of, of, of many religions, and it's even yeah. worse when you don't speak the language. Well, you spoke the language, but it's yeah. it just... Uh, I, I'm coming back. That's actually one of the challenges with operating in the Middle East for guys on the ground like myself. I mean, in a, in a military capacity. Sorry, I didn't mean to take it away from you. Obviously, you've been on the ground as well, loads of times. Yeah. Um, is, the, is the barrier... You've not only got the there's, there's a barrier before the culture barrier, and that's the language barrier. It's like you can almost never understand it without people like yourself. When, when you were, I mean, coming fast, fast forward into yeah. into Fallujah, you have that realization, and you come up with a strategy yeah. of a, a strategy of how it could, what it should be done. Yeah. When you were, when you were talking with, when you first started engaging the, the military units. How were you trying to convey that message and uh, and, and educate them in, in how to do it? And at what level? What yeah. le on the on the ground, for the troops on the ground, at what level were you were you teaching? Yeah, no, it's kind of funny because um, you know, like I'm a rugby player. I was a fireman for a long time. Um, you know, I've sort of been in and around areas, but I'm also like this crazy academic, right? Like just deep into bullshit theory you know so there's like two sides of me and when i went to fallujah i had the academic side you know like um i was spending hours in the library <laughs> memorizing uh the Quran. i've said that a, a few times but you know so when i first landed you know i was in the regimental staff meeting with the colonel and his direct staff and his battalion commanders etc and i'm like oh yeah well you know in the fifth chapter of the quran it talks about the surah al-maida you know and the first you know like this you know i'm like trying to go into details about religion and trying to convince them that religion was important it was just like glazed eyes you know it was like 
<clears throat> they've been up all night planning or working missions, you know, I have no idea. Like, I think I'm saving the world, but, and it doesn't take me long to realize that I'm not having the impact that I want to have. So, um, I did uh, a couple of things. One, I started to basically work my way down the chain of command and, you know, I started meeting with all the battalion commanders. Um, and then within the battalion commanders went to come to command. Ultimately I wound up in the intelligence shops and I wound up working with, you know, Lance corporal corporals. Again, this was like the U S Marine Corps. Um, and they were badasses, right? They had an understanding of their area of operation that nobody else had. I mean, again, I didn't know this before I talked to them. And so it was like a breath of fresh air to be able to talk to them and ask them questions about people like individuals in their areas that had influence. And through those conversations, I wound up finding out that there had already been this uh, mosque monitoring project where U.S. forces had sat outside of a, a mosque and recorded the, the Friday sermon, the chutbah, right? And they'd recorded it, and then they transcribed it. And there were hundreds of thousands of these transcriptions on um, servers and portals and you know, SharePoint sites um, all over Iraq. And I gathered all of them. I started calling people. I said, you know, give me access. I'll download it. And I, I created my own database. Long story short, I created a searchable database. So my, the colonel or the S2 of the regiment could come to me and say, hey, you know, we happen to run into this religious leader. His name is Muhammad. Have you ever heard of him? And I say, okay, yeah, I've got his full name. I've got every sermon that he's um, preached that we were able to record over the past five years. I have every time he's popped up in some other location in the U.S., but I also have um, evaluated each of those sermons, and I've coded them as positive, negative, or neutral. I flagged key terms, and so and basically it becomes a dossier, like a positive, um, not you know, not to go out find them and kill them, but to go out find them and engage with them. It becomes a dossier that says, okay, talk to him about this. This is where he's been. This is what we know about his family, and we believe that he can be a good partner in Saklawia or in downtown Fallujah or Town or wherever it is, we believe that that person can be a good partner. Once I was able to do that and, and you know, share it both up and down the chain of command, it totally changed my ability to have an impact in Fallujah. And from that point on, I was at the, I lived almost, not exclusively, but I lived at that platoon level. I was going out on patrols with, you know, uh, the platoon, so small teams going out into the community, gathering information, basically being like an anthropologist, gathering that information at that really low level, and then working my way back up the chain of command and producing reports for the colonel, you know, let's say monthly, that would be a compilation of all that information and showing him and the entire command how engagement with religious leaders um, can have a positive impact. Um, how do you, have you got any idea or examples of th th that that platoon level and that like the yeah. local leader yeah. level? How how it can change things so much compared to your conventional coin ops? Yeah, yeah. So one of my um, favorite experiences. And if you've been in, well, based probably any um, airfield, uh, certainly in a combat zone, but I was in at Baghdad International and, you know, I was low man on the totem pole and I was sitting at Bayon probably for like three days, just sitting on the flight line. You know, I got my bag and I was just sitting there dusty, making my way from the flight line to the chow hall, you know, to the shitters and like back and forth. You get there, they're like, hey, we're ready for your flight. Oh, shit, there's a, a colonel or a general that's here that needs to go for a flight. So you're screwed, right? So just sitting there for days, and it was late one night, and it's me and my team, um, <coughs> and we're just waiting for this flight. And middle of the night, this gaggle of just dusty, crusty, salty Marines hops up. They like look over at us, they hop up, 
and then they start walking towards us. There's no reason for our, you know, radar to go up because we're on a base. But like immediately, everybody on my team, we'd like perk up and we'd like we usually like, go in that defensive mode. Like, what the hell's going on? Why are these guys coming at us? And they walk over to us. They're in their twenties, young kids, Marines, and they were like, "Hey, you're uh, you're Mr. Thompson, aren't you?" I was like, "Yeah, why?" You know, I mean, like, and and they're like, "Yeah, we remember." He's like, "You don't remember us, do you?" I was like, uh, "No." And they're like, yeah, you were at our outpost, middle of fucking nowhere. I, I didn't even remember where it was. And they're like, yeah, you were talking about like gender roles in Islam and prayer and cultural attributes and, you know, all these words, right? And I'm, I'm sitting here in the back of my head. I'm like, there's 20 year olds talking about like gender and they're not like gyrating. They're not like punching each other in the arm. You're like, they're serious. Right. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, when we when you were talking to us, we were like, I don't know what the fuck this guy's talking about. But he, they were like, as we were out on patrol. And again, these are 20 year olds leading 20 year olds. They're like, as we were out on patrol, we started to see things differently when we, before we would see, you know, the woman and the man and how they were dressed and how they treated each other and be like, oh, it's fucking bullshit. You know what I mean? Just really negative. And you were able to help us see it in a different way. And it has allowed us to engage with the community in an entirely different way and to have a more positive impact um, with them. You know, so they went on in, in a, a couple of different ways to talk about how, the impact that it had. And so, yeah, I mean, the the value of that, it, we, we've been talking about hearts and minds and counterinsurgency theory. Um the way that we make a change in those types of types of environments is how we build relationships. And again, like you said, it's not just, it's not just the words that we use, but it's the posture that we have. You know, you can be taught to shake hands with somebody and look them in the eye and say, Salam Alaikum and you know, all that sort of stuff. But if your posture is, I can't wait till I kill you, then you're not able to build that relationship. Certainly, when you're in those environments, you need to be ready to protect yourself and, and your team at all times. But there's a way to create a posture, which I think is based on a deeper understanding. And, and that's the sort of thing that I feel like I was able to bring to those environments. Mm, that's cool. That they, uh, <laughs> got you in the buy-up. I beat the buy-up. I've never said it for four days. I was very lucky. <laughs> one, one, I'm at, one night was my longest day, which is good yeah, for me. Yeah, it was terrible, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I got so used to it. It was the same thing in Fallujah. We got stuck on the flight line. The only good thing is that we flew in those uh, V-22 Osprey. You ever flown in those? They, uh, they no, are... I've seen them. Yeah. I've seen them. I've never flown in them. <laughs> yeah, that was the only good thing. It's like those things will get after it. So it's pretty nice. <laughs> Going back to the when you were teaching those guys back at the platoon base, um, and specifically about the male female perceived inequality, and in, especially in Islam, or the, or the, and again in quotation marks, oppression of, of women. Yeah. Um, how? Te- tell me what? How, how can can that be understood in a different? I can see. I can see how it can be accepted as normal in the society. Like anything with a different culture, different things, you go, whoa, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, but, yeah. So that's just normal to them, right? What is what is its role? What is that role within Islam? How it yeah, out? yeah. So um, I usually talk about two things when people ask these kinds of questions, you know. And the first thing I say is that when the Prophet Muhammad, you know, had, you know, the way the story is that he um, was visited by the angel Gabriel. Right, and the angel Gabriel recited the Quran to him. So, in Christianity, you know, we understand Jesus as the Word of God. In Islam, um, the Quran is the actual, literal, perfect Word of God. You know, so in Christianity, it's possible to have different um, translations of the Bible. You're sort of like, oh, I think it means this. I think it means that. Means that. But in Islam, it's very different. Um, the Prophet Muhammad was visited by Gabriel and given vi- given direct communication from God. And one of the principles that came out in this time period, you know, at the very beginnings of Islam is, and it's going to sound weird, but the, the fact that women should be treated better, right? 
that women should have some level of equality with men. And so what we see in Islam today is the reflection of a, a world that used to be where, you know, women and children were thrown out into the desert to die. Um, adult women were, <clears throat> you know, they were sort of you know, hordes of men would just grab a woman on the street or the, you know, wherever, take them out into the desert and just have their way with them, right? Just really bad things were happening to women. And so the the message from God to the Prophet Muhammad, as the story goes, is how do we treat women better? How do we give them a higher status in society? One of the ways to do that is to cover them up as a way of of them being a prize that's that should be cherished, right? And so in the 6th century, that was a step forward, right? It was a way for um, women to have a better status in life. <clears throat> Obviously, that is not the case in, you know, the 21st century. <laughs> you know? Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's where it comes from and why it came about. Again, you know, I'm, I'm generally reluctant to talk about whether any religion should, um, or how it should implement um, what it believes to be the genuine source of its uh, beliefs. Um, you know, but, you know, we can obviously say that there are, there are religious leaders within Islam who um, have different opinions about um, how women should be treated and what they should wear. You know, the, the, yeah, go ahead. No, no, sorry. So, so okay, this is fascinating. One of the things I, in my naivety, one of the things when I was younger, my, my parents are both Roman Catholic. I was born uh, Roman Catholic. Yeah, I'm not religious. Yeah. My dad is no longer religious. My mum is, but she's not sort of practicing. Like I said, Irish yeah. and Scottish. Um, one of the, I, I remember getting into the discussion with, uh, is it in the early days of Twitter? It must have been like 08, <laughs> 09, something like that. And... It was it was at a point in England where the English Church, and I, I might be bastardising re- recollecting this, but they had they had decided to allow same sex marriage, or they were considering it, or something. It was in it was in, and there was a, a, a someone came on Twitter, a person I knew, and said, "This is amazing." Da, 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 da. And to me, I thought that's bullshit, and not because I'm homophobic. Not because I don't think that, you know, and you can do what you want and uh, marry whoever you want, love whoever you want, right? But because I thought, I was horrified that that this religion that everyone believes in, as in Christianity, or whichever denomination you're talking about, Christianity, that they, I felt like they were being forced into accepting something which, which was not what God said, right? Now, down the line, I realised after conversation with people more intelligent than me around religion, yeah. like the Bible, like exactly like you said, the Bible is a is a hodgepodge of yeah. of Chinese hearsay about stories that happened a long, long, long time ago. So it's not the word of God. So when I think back to that, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know that. I'm just an idiot. Like, God, it wasn't the word of God. <laughs> like, it's great, but putting that into perspective, what you're talking about here is it. Perhaps it's one of the reasons where, perhaps it's one of the reasons why. Um, why Christianity has done so well in terms of it's you know it's it's connected largely with Western society and perhaps that the inflexibility of Islam because it's directly the word of God you can't have been change it perhaps that's been a hindrance on on the development of is of uh, Islam predominantly Islam societies there even yeah. Asia, maybe yeah I mean I would say it differently you know I would say that it it creates a a very different dynamic. It is less, much less, I mean, it's significantly more difficult to um, to change what's considered to be the core of the religion. Um, I don't want to give the impression, however, that Islam itself is somehow, uh, you know, like I said before, the stories that exist inside of me are part of who I am. And I've spent so much time living with Muslims that I love and care about. And I've experienced parts of the culture that have, that continue 
to be an important part of who I am as a person, right? And so even though, you know, I'm Roman Catholic and, um, you know, I, I don't identify in any way with being Muslim, I, I don't want to dishonor the, the experiences, the people, the concepts, et cetera, that have had such an important, profound experience for me. It puts me in a, a difficult situation and I'll, I'll tell another story. So when I was in, uh, so I was in graduate school at the university of Chicago and I was, I, I just kept getting really frustrated. I'm like this really impatient person, you know, once I identify with the mission as I want to go and I want to do it and I want to win. Right. And I'm in graduate school and people are like, Oh yeah, you know, I'll take 10 years to get my PhD and I'll take eight years to learn Arabic and maybe, and I'm like, no, this is fucking bullshit. Like I need to win. And so, um, I met someone and they were like, come, come live with me in Alexandria in, in Egypt. Right. And I said, okay. And I put myself through something like a medieval, um, training regimen, you know, it was like, I had a benefactor and it was this person who knew, I mean, to, to the memorization of the, the dot above the letter deepness of fundamental Islam, both the violent kind and the nonviolent kind. And I identified him as someone who had the thing that I wanted most, this knowledge, right? And so I went to live with him and I don't know why I did this, but he like treated me like I was a kid, right? You know, I'd show up at his house at like 8 a.m. and he'd be like, uh, why aren't you here at 7? So I'd show up at 7 the next day. Why aren't you here at 6? I'd show up at 6, right? And every day I'd show up and we would study and memorize the Quran and memorize these religious law. And five days later, he would make me recite the thing that I learned a week before, you know? And when I didn't get it, he would yell at me and we would eat all our meals together. I would buy food for his wife and kid, you know what I mean? Like, I poured everything into him. I mean, it was Egypt. It wasn't really expensive, but I poured everything into him and helping him and his family because he was helping me become this person, this expert that I wanted to become. And I did that for a number of months. And afterwards, I realized that I was able to, when I went back to school and people would say, well, you know, the fundamentalist this, the terrorist this, Islam that. And I'd be like, well, actually in the 13th century, if you read this book, it says here, and I'd like recite part of the book. And, and then, but also in the 18th century, like this part of the Quran, you know, and, and I didn't know this transformation had happened, right? And it <clears throat> dawned on me when I got back to Chicago, and, I, and I, the reason I'm telling this story is because I started to say to you, it puts me in an uncomfortable situation. It puts me in an uncomfortable situation to be, if for shorthand, I'll say a patriot and to know deeply about Islam. And so when I came back from Alexandria, Egypt, and I, I could talk about 13th century and recite off the top of my head, that's when I first had that feeling of discomfort. I was like, there's a fundamentalist Muslim living inside of me. <laughs> you know, the person that I hate, not, sorry, not the fundamentalist, the terrorist, right? I was like, the the people that I'm trying to dismantle, right, and take away all power that they have, some part of that exists inside of me. Like when, when I'm reading about why they do things or I read their pamphlets or their websites, like I can finish the quotation. And that's fucking uncomfortable, you know. And so I had that experience. And then I went to Oman not long after that and I started to, you know, one of the principles that I worked on is I never lied about who I was. I never, you know, I, even when I was in Egypt, you know, I'm Roman Catholic as well. I, I went to mass. I was found a church and I never lied about who I was, even when I was on that bus in Yemen. But when I was in Oman, um, again, I, I met someone who helped me, right? And they were like, if you want to learn Islam, then you're going to wear what we wear. You're going to the mosque with us. I fasted Ramadan, you know, and... <clears throat> At the end of that experience, I was like, not only is there this fundamentalist in my head, like I look like one now, like, and I know how to, I, I, it's not just that I can talk about, it, like, I know how to pray. And I know, you know, like I said, I fasted Ramadan. And, 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 and in those moments, like when you, like for me, when I fast 
fasted Ramadan, when I was, I spent all my time, like I stopped listening to music in this period of my life and I would only listen to the recitations of the Quran or something um, from the religion. Um, you know, you, I had experiences where I was like, I get it. You know, you listen to this beautiful passage from the Quran and you know the references and you have the imagery and it's like, shit, that is fucking beautiful, you know, or that does make me feel good. And so, you know, we're talking about, you know, what is the role of Islam and <clears throat> how did it, how has it developed over time? And there obviously is a lot of reason, especially in the line of work that you and I have been in, um, to be critical and to be um, on guard. At the same time, inside of me, I have this um, experience of Islam, which, uh, I don't know, it gives me something else. I don't know how to characterize it, but it gives me something else. Is it, is the perpetuation of that fundamentalist, ter terrorism, fundamentalist terrorism associated with Islam, is the perpetuation of that partly, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think you, you just being, you don't want to, I think you, you probably doing what I don't want to do is, is uh, give an indication that Islam is the bad thing. Yeah. Um, I, I understand. So I try. It's hard. These. It's hard. These. Days, unless you give things any depth of thought I, or uh, have any rational head to think. I mean, ignore Islam. You know, to think anyone. If you think, uh, uh, I don't know. I guess let's. Uh, all Italians. You think? Yeah. Right. All Italians right, are slimy. Right. All Italians right. are slimy, and yeah. all the men, they all get you women. It's the same. You can't think yeah. all of all of Islam are terrorists. Yeah. I understand what you're doing, but just just. Do you think that um, the perpetuation of fundamentalist terrorism to do with Islam is is partly due to the inflexibility of the Quran and the way it is? I, I, I think the way the way I would say it is that it provides a platform. So yeah, so you cannot change the Quran. It, that is not an and option. And the reason I ask is because if it is, then oh man, it's a hard battle to to to, to get rid of the, the, that fundamentalism. Terrorism. I mean, yeah, you know, so if, if we ask the question of how to get rid of that terrorist uh, version of Islam, I think the answer is it, it involves religion, you know, for, on our side to understand it. But it is it is counterinsurgency theory, right? The way we dismantle terrorism is by creating stable societies. Religion is part of a, it can be part of a stable society, but the reason people put their heads down when it comes to terrorists and supporting terrorists is a lesson I learned on that bus in Yemen and all, all over the place. And that is because people are afraid or they have no power or they have no recourse. And so when we talk about hearts and minds, the reason we talk about that is because, you know, and again, this is like straight out of the counterinsurgency book. You cannot kill enough terrorists to kill terrorism. The way that we kill terrorism is by building stable societies um, where people are emboldened to stand up and to resist. You know, like we, we know the stories of terrorists paying um, a local farmer five dollars, which is an incredible sum, to just dig the hole. Just dig a hole over here. I don't, you know, don't even worry about why you're digging the hole. And then spend, you know, pays five dollars to someone else to, you know, hey, just take this, this cell phone and just put it in that hole, or just take this package and put it in that hole. Pay somebody else to, you know what I mean? The re everybody knows what's going on, right? But the reason that's possible is because people live in unstable communities. And as we as those communities are able to be um, supported that becomes the organic or natural deterrent to terrorism. Is the is the interventionist foreign policy of UK, US, and other countries is that the is is that the way things should be gone about? And I'm talking on a broad I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. talking in each yeah, I mean, yeah. is it because if if we, you know if it's through the coin, if it's through coin counterinsurgency, yeah. then. It, you always have to take that interventionist approach, and the reason I ask about that is because one of the one of the issues with it has got to with this whole inverted commas war is the impact that the war on terror against uh, Islamic terrorism 
has on the relationship between the Western world and the you know Arabian world, and and so and they suffer for that. Uh, you know, yeah. we both yeah. both sides suffer for it. Yeah. But yeah. but the I think the, on the Arabian side of things, the Islam side of things, the, the Saudi, the Yemen's, the UAE, um, Iran, there is they've got a tool that they can manipulate if they want to do so, and that is the terrorism side yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's so complicated, right? You know, like our relationships. I mean, just from the U.S. perspective, but it's it's you know more countries in the U.S. You know, you think about our relationship with a country like Saudi Arabia, and it'll make your head spin. It's like you know, especially you know, I worked in classified environments just like you did. You know, it's like the deeper you get into it, the more you're like, holy fuck, boys! Like, what the hell is going on here? Like, who's our friend and who's our enemy? You know, so you know, you're asking sort of the gut punch question of right, like, like interventionists at all. And I think that there, I think the U S um, I think we should be involved around the world. I think that there are moral reasons for that, but also just national defense reasons for that. I just think we should go about it differently. Right. I think that, um, you know, there's this idealist and pragmatic perspective perspective on international relations. And I think in the U S we, we tend towards the idealist perspective too much. We say things like, which I said, I can fix the Middle East. You know, we have various presidents who come and say, I have these principles and morals, and I'm going to impose it. I'm going to use the might of the United States to do that. <clears throat> that idealism, sort of optimism, runs smack dab into the face of reality, you know, and, and then that tends to cause all sorts of reactions and we just pendulum swing back and forth. So yes, I think we should be involved uh, around the world. I just think we should be more pragmatic about it. And that means reassessing the kinds of relationships we have with specific countries. Yeah. I mean, our idea of idealism and, and what we think is good for them is completely, yeah. uh, it's, we, yeah. we don't know. I don't know. You know, like, yeah. do you want to, it's, and we go in there with that naivety. It's maybe not on the, not on the strategic you know, planning levels, but certainly in a, the grassroots for myself. Yeah. Like, people like myself on the ground who, who are taught to be soldiers and, or sailors and airmen. Yeah. And we don't know any better. It's, it's the understanding that we've got no idea what works for them. The, yeah. the, the, the farmer in Helmand province or the, the farmer in, you know, the, the marshlands of flipping in northern yeah. Iraq. Yeah. Just, they, they, they couldn't care less about. The, the freedoms that we would never give up, yeah, never yeah. give up. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, and, I re I remember being in Helmand, you know, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, working for you know um, international aid agency, and you know, the, my counterparts there were like, oh yeah, we just need to spend the money. I was like, but what are you spending the money on? They're like, well, you know, just whatever. We're gonna put in like brand new future age air conditioning units. So, what are you talking about? That's not that there's no long-term value there. Yeah. yeah we just got to spend the money, you know? And you're like, again, like you said, at the strategic level, building stable communities, engaging with the local population, you're like, got it right. That all makes sense. But at a, on the ground level, like dealing with Afghans one-on-one -on -one, things get lost. And that to me is what needs to be solved. Right. How do we ensure that what happens at a policy level is actually enacted for the goals, like the priorities that have been established, which is to make these communities um, stable. But what, what it winds up happening in a lot of ways is people have um, performance metrics, right? They're expected to, whatever it is, spend this amount of money, um, I don't know, establish this number, many bases, or whatever it is. And those metrics create a natural tension or conflict with uh, what everyone's supposed to do. So, um it's a difficult problem to solve, but, you know, I think certainly in like U.S. Uh, foreign policy, we tend to be more optimistic and more self-assured than we, we should, you know. And so, again, you know, when I went to uh, Fallujah, it was good intentions for the U.S. military to say, okay, we're not going to interact with uh, religious leaders. The intentions were good. There was some theory or some idea somewhere that said, yeah, we don't know anything about this, so let's not piss anybody off. We don't want to cause any trouble. But it, you're losing such an opportunity there that 
it's worth taking risks here and there, like calculated risks, not like you know just any old risk. You, you you reminded me of a feeling there when I when I when I was serving, and it's exactly why they didn't want to engage with the religious leaders. Oh, yeah. They don't know anything about it. It's sensitivity. You it, it, it reminded me why. I, I, it was yeah. baffling me earlier. Why the why the hell did we think to? But it's because it's sensitivity. You go, whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to tread in over there. Going to cause right dramas. Yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. absolutely what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah Do you um? Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. Do you? In the book, do you do you touch on on that sort of the policy side of things, the strategy side of things? Yeah. So my book, you know, um, the title of my book is called "I'll Go," right? And it's really a um, it's a story of someone who doesn't know that he's like really mission oriented. And I just I find these opportunities all throughout my life where someone says, "Hey, we need you to go to the worst place in the world." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'll go there. I'll go do that. I don't care." Right? And so there are a few instances. So I worked for General Petraeus, um, and I worked with uh, General McChrystal. Uh, I worked at Central Command, you know, U.S. Central Command in Tampa. So there are parts of the book where I talk about how um, strategy is formulated. And then, you know, when I'm deployed, I talk about how we implement that strategy. But it's not a strategy book. It's more along the lines of a story about my life and about the experiences that I had and how I put them together. Some, like I said, some interesting cameos and uh, snippets about strategy policy, but it's not the, the primary theme of it. During your time in, when you, was, when you were embedded in Islam, um, Learning the rope, shall we say. How much of a challenge was it to maintain a grip on your own faith? Yeah, you know, um, I was just talking about that yesterday with one of my friends, you know, and he was surprised that I um, that I was honest about who I was always, you know, and that I, you know, I never lied about being Roman Catholic or about being American, even though, uh, you know, there were times where I could have fit in and it probably would have made my life a lot easier. Um I think my faith in particular, right, um, was what helped keep me grounded. You know, so I was constantly, you know, before I was, um, you know, an advisor to the military, I was always by myself and I was always exposed in some way. And usually the people I was with did not like me or hated me, right? They were these fundamentalist types who were like, you're a non-Muslim and I could rightfully kill you, Right. So I think going to mass when I was in the Middle East was a way for me to be like, in, like literally like a sanctuary, right? Somewhere that, you know, I know the words, you know, like I know the Quran and I can recite it. But there, even though, like I said, I had this experience of, of deep appreciation, it still wasn't coming from who I am. You know, it's like reading a good book or watching a good movie. You can really appreciate it. And maybe, you know, people memorize lines from a movie, but there's still a depth there that wasn't um, from my soul, I guess. So being able to do that, I think, helped keep me sane. I, I think about, you know, it makes me think about how difficult it would be for someone who goes completely undercover. You know, at least for me, I had that outlet and that release and that honesty um, that kept me. I mean, I, I still, in my head, I still got fucked up after, you know, doing this for so long. And I was like in a really bad headspace afterwards. Um, but I think it allowed me to do it for as long as I did without going insane. Was the challenge of that, was that headspace challenge that, that down to that conflict you had with, with understanding and being knowledgeable at Islam compared to uh, being, as you said, yeah, you know, patriot, Roman Catholic, yeah. uh, Western society. Was, was it that? Or was there other things compounding it? I think there were. There's probably two big things. One is, you know, I essentially put my life on hold for 13 years. You know, I wasn't having relationships. I barely saw my family and friends. Um, I spent a lot of time um, around people who didn't like me. That's one side of it. The second side of it is, you know, like everyone. Um, I've experienced a number of traumatic experiences, right? And so <clears throat> because I was so mission-focused, I never took the time to process either side of that, right? Like the traumatic experiences or 
the fact that I put my life on hold or was disconnected from everything I'd known about life up until that point. And so that, yeah, that created um, an unavoidable, probably anybody who knew me, um, you know, predictable sort of crash in, in who I was for some time. What did you? I know you came back and you um, and you 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 basically been to get me out of here. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking about the, the other podcast. What after that position you had in the states doing you know military yeah. advisory position? What what did you do, what did you do after that? What did you do now? Yeah, what's giving you saying? What's your what's your mission, Alex? What's your yeah, mission? yeah. So in um, 2014, I so yeah so. In 2014, I was living and working in Bahrain. I was working with the Marine Corps again, uh, you know, and I was living what I thought would have been my best life. There's a, a massive rugby club in Bahrain. I was great friends with the Marines. I lived, you know, my company that I worked for uh, paid for my flat there, and I had a, like a rooftop pool, and we had parties there. You know, I just had a great time, and I was probably the most depressed I've ever been in my life. I would come home from work and I would sit in the dark and <clears throat> I couldn't motivate myself to do anything. I mean, I, thankfully I had the energy to go to work, but like, you know, I stopped hanging out with my friends and it was nothingness. There weren't, you know, some people suffer from flashbacks or memories or sounds and there was just nothing. There was, it, it's hard to explain just this emptiness right where i'd like I said i've been so mission focused for so long and, and like in that emptiness and that darkness there was just this small voice that said go home and i don't know if you're anything like me but my internal voice is like a drill sergeant right like you know i go on like 20 30 mile <laughs> bike rides and like you know m mile like 15 there's a voice in my head you better get after it you know like you're not tired let's go keep you know I mean, that's the voice normally in my head when I'm facing a challenge and, you know, I need to get through it. But in that moment, it was, it, it hit me so hard because it was a quiet, reassuring voice that said, go home. And I didn't wrestle. I didn't struggle with it. I, I packed up my stuff and I, I went back to DC and I made, I made three commitments to myself. And, but the, the most important commitment was that I would settle down, right? And over the next few months, I met my partner and it was the first time I genuinely, truly fell in love and probably the first time that I did something for myself for, I don't know when it started, but certainly since 9-11, everything I did was for the mission. You know, this mission of, of fixing U.S. Middle East policy. And so I met my partner, um, he grew up just outside of Kansas city and I was like, fuck it. You know, like I had my, you know, security clearances and I had my PhD in hand. I could have gone, you know, there's all sorts of other things that I could have gone off to do. And I said, fuck everything. I need to do something for myself. And so I moved out to Kansas City from Washington, D.C. And if, if you don't know, Kansas City is not a bustling metropolis. It's not one of the biggest cities in the U.S. <laughs> but my mission in life now is to, um, is to, to become that Alex that, uh, I have, I, that I dream about. You know, so there's an Alex who went out and, and did everything when it comes to the Middle East, right? But there's also an Alex who's been separated, you know, and sort of disconnected from everyday life. And, you know, my partner has um, two kids, right? So I get to be a stepdad, you know, I get to live in the suburbs and... Um, you know, all of those sorts of things, which I thought I would never do. I never thought that I would settle down. I never thought that I would live in the suburbs. But I've learned so much about why I did all the things that I did and how, like I said, I can become that person. I don't know. You know, it's just like the flashes of this person that I, that I thought about becoming through the course of my life. That's what I'm doing now. And it's. 
it's not as outwardly, you know, like I can't tell stories about, you know, uh, I went on a bike ride, you know, I can't tell stories about how we, you know, sat with the neighbors the other day and had beers or something. You know, I got to tell stories about being on the bus in Yemen and being in Fallujah and being in Helmand. And so it's a different kind of adventure. It's not as, it's not for other people, honestly. It's just not for other people. It's for me. I understand it. Yeah, I, I that feeling of nothingness, I experienced that. I experienced it first when I came back from my first tour of Africa. And it was on my r and and it literally first day, um, first day back, I, I literally landed that day, sat in a bar, and uh, very strange feeling and very difficult to explain. Yeah. And just listen to you then, I think the way I explain it, it n- there was nothing I was seeing or hearing or doing that was stimulating. Nothing. Yeah. While I sat there, I, I just said, no, there was just, I had nothing. There was no, there was no feeling. There was yeah. no feeling whatsoever. It was, I, I just, it, I tried to explain. Nothing there. It wasn't yeah. I was sad. It wasn't yeah. I was missing anything. It was just nothing. Absolutely yeah. nothing there. And and when I don't know if it's the same for you, but that what the only time I had feeling was if I was on operations, yeah. or if I was with military mates at home, or and or if I was drinking. Yeah, Outside yeah. of that, zero. And one of the like one of the big ways that impacted me was decision making because I had nothing in me to base <laughs> on just normal just basic decision making at home normal you know g- give me military decision easy right? yeah right 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 but because I had because I didn't care I just I couldn't just commit to anything I couldn't make yeah. a decision or anything yeah. I didn't care very yeah. very strange feeling yeah so, and, and then- uh and hearing you, I've never heard anyone else say it about it before. You're, you're the first person to mention it. Wow. I'm sure that I'm sure. many, many people experience it. And I think that's the value. You know, in my book, I write about a lot of things um, that I don't talk about. I write about people that I never talk about, experiences that I've never talked about. And the only reason, you know, I wrote through the tears was things like this. Right, because there are people out there who have had who have experiences that they don't know how to put words to, and I suffered. You know, there was a time when it was there was nothingness, and then there was a time when I couldn't control my emotions. You know, I would be out with my friends or by myself. You know, and I would just become overwhelmed. But again, there were no there were no like. There was nothing that I saw or heard that caused me to lose control of my emotions. It just happened, you know, and I had to spend the years, you know, I call it, you know, the wild animal, right? Like I had to spend years understanding, you know, first I didn't see that wild animal until it was on top of me and I was crumpled up in an emotional mess, right? And I had to spend years, okay, well, it's five meters away it's 10 meters away you know and now it's like i can see when it's coming you know and have all sorts of techniques or whatever to deal with it you know but we have to take care of each other you know and we have to be bold about sharing our experiences so that others don't get lost in it you know <laughs> hey that's why i started the podcast you spoke ah. it like a true uh yeah. a true prodigy absolutely but i i think We'll uh, we'll ra- we'll wrap it up at this point absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. listen, Alex, I uh, I would love to have you on again, mate, and it'd be yeah, really definitely. interesting to talk about that that mental journey side of things. Um, yeah. You said a lot of things that resonate with me. If they resonate with me, then uh, then they resonate with a lot of my listeners, a lot of my viewers. Yeah, uh, and 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 I absolutely agree. For those people who are willing to go to that little bit of discomfort to talk about their experiences, as people come out the other side in order to help others get through their battle, then I think if, we, if we're willing to, we should. And especially yeah. if, if we're fortunate to have, to have people who want to listen to us. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's do it again, mate. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm definitely in. Your book is out end of July. Yeah, yep. Can I assume you're going to be putting a link to it on your website? I will, yep. yep. And my website, the website is uh, thisherolife.com. Thisherolife.com. I'll put a link to that in the blurb of this on the on my website. And when you when you when you when the book gets released, in fact, let me know after this one's getting released, and I'll I'll share it when it when it comes out as well. Yeah, cool. I, uh, that's after I get the first copy. <laughs> I'll buy the first copy. Buy the first yeah, copy. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, um, I'd love it. Is there anything else, mate? You wanna you wanna touch on? 
No, I just, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. You know, I've listened to some of your podcasts, and like you said, it's, it's really important. You know, there are way too many veterans or people who've been in these um, environments who are um, lost and feel alone. You know, we have to stand up and be willing to sh- uh, shoulder the burden. Like you said, not everybody can talk about what they've experienced, but if we can, then we should. And I just think that's really important. So I, I, I'm really thankful that um, you do this podcast, and uh, I'm glad, you know, we got to talk. So thanks a lot. Yeah, it's good, mate. I f- in fact, one more thing. I forgot yeah. you're a rugby player. You yeah. Know, and I, we, we, uh, I've just set up a veterans rugby team, rugby club in the UK called um, Forces Barbarians, RSC. Oh, nice. Uh, we're, yeah, we're looking at going to DC for tour, actually. Uh, <laughs> you should have moved. You should have yeah. moved. Well, I'll send I you still, the link. Yeah, well, my club is still there, so I'll get you connected with them. What's the club? Western Suburbs Rugby. Oh, mate. Uh, I... I'll drop you a message after this, but somebody's yeah, yeah. speaking about that. Yeah, um, and I'm going to be out there in August, um, and I'll see the guys, so um, I'll be able to, and I, you know, I talk to them all the time, so uh, yeah, let's, we'll chat after this, and we'll figure it out. Right. Been awesome, Alex. Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate see it. See you soon. Have a good one. Bye.